Okay. So welcome to this discussion of gender performance requirements of the US military in the war on Islamic terrorism, a discussion I've captioned under the title I'll tell you more about, uh, quote, you're telling me it's wrong to do to the prisoners what the army does to its own soldiers, unquote. Uh, I should warn you, uh, both in the room and on the tape, that this is going to be a sexually explicit discussion, uh, including foul language. The foul language is going to be a quote, the sexually explicit uh, part is uh, necessitated by uh, the subject matter, uh, which is um, the uh, use of uh, sexual uh, abuse um, in a variety of venues uh, in which the US military uh, conducts interrogation and detention uh, of Islamic male uh, detainees uh, since uh, September 11th. And uh, I was interested in looking at the various reports uh, of sexual uh, and gender stereotypes, the most famous uh, of which comes from Abu Ghraib, uh, think uh, Lindy England, uh, leading around uh, a male detainee on a leash, but also uh, the forced nudity, the forced masturbation, the forced piling into sexual positions of the detainees uh, at uh, Abu Ghraib uh, and elsewhere. And there are other uh, examples uh, where uh, in Guantanamo, perhaps also in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq, uh, female military personnel were, uh, either did or were encouraged to degrade male uh, Muslim prisoners through forced cross-sex contact, through exposure of the, the women's uh, naked bodies or uh, of the naked bodies of the detainees, touching prisoners with items uh, soaked in menstrual blood, uh, attempts made to feminize the detainees themselves by keeping them naked, by forcing them into sexualized performance, threats of rape, simulated uh, and actual rape with objects, um, use of women's underwear, including pink women's underwear being placed on the detainees' heads at Abu Ghraib, uh, and bras and other items of women's underwear being placed in their uh, ordinary places, but on male detainees' bottomies uh, at, uh, at Guantanamo. Uh, there was a, a female um, uh, interpreter who was uh, told to uh, use sexually humiliating Arabic terms to, uh, to degrade a, a male detainee and on and on and on. Um, and what I uh, originally proposed to do when I started this project is look at the ways in which these practices do gender-based harm, uh, not only to the men who are their targets, but to the military women involved uh, in carrying them out. And I should say uh, also by way of caveat that I'm not an expert uh, in, uh, in torture or the law of torture. Uh, I am, however, uh, a, an expert in um, gendered um, treatment uh, in US uh, law and, 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 it, and in US life. And that became surprisingly more relevant to me uh, as I uh, pursued this uh, paper. One of the things that I ha have done uh, in my uh, past is uh, I was one of the observers of the integration uh, of women into the Virginia Military Institute, uh, a, an all-male uh, military academy run by the state of uh, Virginia that the Supreme Court uh, ordered uh, admit women uh, at uh, the turn uh, of the millennium. And um, this became much more relevant than I thought it would be. I thought this was going to be a paper uh, about the other, and it turns out uh, to be uh, far more uh, a project uh, about the self. And if I put this in terms of the um, media references very often used to uh, describe uh, the abusive practices uh, of Americans, this is less uh, a project about 24 uh, than about something I, uh, I wouldn't have thought that I would have endorsed as a descriptive matter, which is the, the cultural reference used by um, Rush Limbaugh and um, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, which is that this was, quote, like animal house on the night shift. Um, and uh, in endorsing this description, uh, I'm not endorsing the, the minimization uh, of the problem. I mean, what, what I'm going to argue is that um, although a lot of the discussions of where these practices came from and why they were imposed, focus on the othering of Arab male detainees. Uh, for example, uh, much was made of the fact that a, a book written by an anthropologist called The Arab Mind was assigned to um, various uh, military personnel, and, and it described how peculiarly sensitive uh, it may be that uh, 
Islamic uh, Arab males are to sexual humiliation. Um, in the end, it seems to me that uh, where a lot of the practices came from was from the soldiers' uh, own experiences. And uh, that it's, it's about treating the other like the self. But the interesting lesson is that treating the other like the self doesn't amount to uh, treating the other well. Uh, and I think that the, the, the quote with which I've titled this presentation sums up uh, my findings with respect to the first part uh, of uh, the project. I'm going to focus myself on three quotes, two from interrogators, uh, and the title is one, and one from a detainee. Uh, the title, uh, you're telling me it's wrong to do the prisoners what the army does to its own soldiers, is in fact what one of the interrogators said when questioned about uh, a, a particular practice. The practice in question was not a sexual one, it was stress positions. But the uh, argument can be carried over from the non-sexual practices to, uh, to the sexual practices with, with everything uh, in between. Um, and a, a couple of things uh, can be said from the fact that if you look down the list of practices, and let me just read uh, a, a bunch of them, uh, coming from uh, the Taguba report on Abu Ghraib, here are uh, a, an almost complete list uh, of the uh, abusive practices, punching, slapping, kicking, jumping on their naked feet, videotaping, photographing, uh, forcibly arranging in sexually explicit positions, keeping them naked, forcing them to wear women's underwear, forcing them to masturbate themselves, uh, arranging naked male detainees in a pile, jumping on them, um, attaching wires to their fingers and toes, writing things on them such as, I am a rapist, uh, placing dog chains or straps around their necks, um, and using military working dogs and taking photographs uh, of, uh, of them in these positions. With the exception of the use of dogs, every one of those practices is detailed in uh, reports of uh, hazing, both in boot camp, in fraternity hazing, uh, in uh, hazing such as the sort that uh, goes on at, at, at places like uh, Virginia Military Institute. Um, and one of the thing this, things this says is something about the limits of the torturer's uh, imagination. Uh, but another thing it says is uh, when it's cited uh, as a justification, uh, it's, it's cited in a sort of good lawyering way. So uh, one of the, um, the interrogators uh, said, uh, in justifying his, uh, his practices, uh, this is a guy named Chris Mackey, uh, who says, how can we justify this? Uh, it was like confronting a tax question in the office back home. This is what we want the answer to be. The abiding theme of the convention is you can never treat prisoners worse than you treat your own men. And it was in this interpretation that I saw some wiggle room for me. He was there talking about sleep deprivation, saying as long as he and his men were awake this long, it was OK to keep the detainees awake this long. But if you look for, first at some of the non-sexualized practices, one of them that got a, a fair amount of press when it was imposed on a female detainee was forcing the detainees to burn excrement. Now, um, if you look at this as a practice, it's a practice that has to be done in the military. It's a practice that is often given to members of the military uh, as a low-level form of punishment, precisely because it's an unpleasant and relatively degrading activity. And it's that, I think, that has carried over. Uh, the you know, non-interrogators also describe, with respect to their own experiences, uh, things like um, a, a practice they call field fucking. Uh, which involves uh, perpetrating simulated anal rape on uh, someone who they, someone of their company who they think has transgressed the norms. Uh, and that involves also you know, stripping them, uh, writing things on their bodies, uh, and so on. Uh, one other piece of evidence for the fact that uh, there is uh, a very real connection between what happens uh, to the soldiers and what happens to the detainees is uh, when one of the uh, people who broke the story uh, uh, on Abu Ghraib was interviewed by Anderson Cooper, he said, you know, I first saw the pictures uh, of prisoners on a pile uh, as a screensaver on, uh, on my computer. And when I first saw it, I laughed because I thought it was soldiers. 
And then I stopped laughing when I realized it was detainees uh, and they didn't have a choice. Now, I, I agree that it's much worse to do these sorts of things uh, to detainees, but I'm going to talk in a little while uh, about why uh, I think the lesson is, that I would want to draw is the opposite lesson from Rush Limbaugh. Not that it's OK uh, to treat these detainees this way because the practices come from hazing, but that we ought to be a lot more worried than we have hitherto been about the way uh, hazing proceeds. Uh, and you know, a few more examples of the ways in which these practices carry over. Greener, who was uh, one of the ringleaders uh, at Abu Ghraib uh, and allegedly um, poured fluorescent light fluid on um, uh, some detainees and um, you know, threatened or may have actually penetrated them with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with light, um, took this same fluorescent light fluid and poured it on his own penis and walked around like this and had himself photographed uh, doing this. So again, I want to say that we need to worry more than we already do about uh, the, the hazing practices we engage in. And I'm particularly interested in this as a feminist theorist. And here's why. Uh, it's a quote from uh, another, uh, uh, a quote, actually not from, a, from an interrogator. This is a quote from, from one of the, uh, of the detainees uh, himself. And he says, um, look, they, they, they beat me up. Uh, and uh, that's okay, you know, beatings, uh, I, they're no big deal, I can take them. But he went on to say, quote, here's the worst thing they did. They wanted us to feel as though we were women, the way women feel. And this is the worst insult, to feel like a woman, unquote. Now what I want to argue is this is something on which the American military personnel and the Arab detainees can agree. This is not just something that's uh, exoticized to the Arab mind. And the soldiers know exactly how these kinds of feminizing uh, treatments will make the detainees feel because they know how they felt when these same kind of practices were uh, imposed on them. And so one of the things I've been interested in in pursuing this project is how universal uh, it is to, uh, in, in military training to denigrate people by uh, comparing them to women. The first time I ever uh, gave a version of this talk, I was doing it on a naval base in Amsterdam for an audience that included members of the military from around the world. And I put out the question, um, uh, you know, how universal a practice is this? And a, uh, an American friend of mine who was sitting in the middle of the Dutch Navy uh, reports back that at that point they all turned to one another and shook their heads and say, oh, no, no, we do not denigrate people by comparing them to women. We denigrate people by comparing them to homosexuals. Um, I, I put that out to you, uh, and I also say that my experience uh, of, uh, of uh, seeing the integration of women at VMI is that one of the reasons VMI originally resisted the integration of women was because they felt that they could no longer be abusive to their cadets in the same way they had been. And one of the ways they had been abusive was by calling them you know, girls or little girls. And as Chris Littleton, a, uh, a feminist theorist uh, in a law school, has said, now th this loses a lot of its flavor when you're saying, what are you a woman, to an actual woman. right? You know, what she, she's going to say, yeah, you want to make something of it? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, a woman. So uh, the interesting thing is that the uh, appropriate thing now for VMI uh, cadets to be called by way of denigration is maggot. Now maggot is on the one hand um, you know, a low form of life, it's on the other hand one letter off from a slur for homosexual. Uh, and I you know, ask you to, to, to note that. So I think that one reason to be concerned about uh, these uh, practices is from the perspective of, of sex and gender equality. But another reason to be concerned about it is from the perspective uh, of, uh, of effectiveness. And I want to argue that uh, in addition to uh, looking to hazing practices and boot camp practices for inspiration, uh, it's generally acknowledged that a source of inspiration for these practices was something called SEER, uh, which is survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. What it has in common with the hazing practices, it, it was about doing to the other what was done to us. These are practices that uh, the soldiers themselves underwent in their training uh, for the purpose of better being able to resist interrogation by others. 
Another thing these, pra and, and, and the seer practices also specifically involved uh, gender denigration. So one of the things seer training involved was the kind of thing that the Arab linguist uh, said she was asked to do, which is denigrating the sexual prowess and size of the sex organs and that sort of thing to, to detainees. It's another thing that uh, these practices have in common, which is that they are misapplied in their purpose when they are applied to the war on terror. So that in the case of hazing, the idea is to break someone down, to build them up into whatever you want them to be, uh, including uh, you know, a, a, a fully functioning member of your military team. In the case of SEER, what you were being asked to resist was the sort of interrogation uh, imposed by uh, the communists, in particular the communist Koreans and Chinese. And the argument there was also that you wanted to break someone down so you would turn them into whatever you wanted to be them to be by false confession if necessary. And the problem here is that false confessions are of no use in the war on terror. We want true confessions. We want information. We don't want to break people down uh, simply for the purpose of breaking them down or for the purpose of building them up into whatever new man we want them to be, whether the new communist man uh, or the new uh, military man. And, um, all those who have done empirical research on what works uh, with respect to such techniques have come back with the message that gentler techniques are more often likely to be effective than harsh techniques. So the technique uh, that was favored in uh, the US military in the war on terror goes by the technical name fear up harsh. Harsh being an added, added uh, intensifier to the fear up techniques where fear down and ego up, the kinds of techniques that, make, that, that are gentle and um, affiliative, uh, have a more proven uh, success record. Nevertheless, even uh, interrogators, uh, women and men, who began using these gentler techniques, uh, there's evidence that they abandoned them over time. And the reason why gets me to the, th that they gave for abandoning these techniques uh, gets me to the third of the three quotations around which I've organized this analysis. And again, forgive the language, it's a quote. The quote is, they'll think we're fucking pussies, we can't let them fuck us every time. Now I hope you realize that this is the flip side of the feminization that the detainee uh, says was imposed on him. It's important to make the detainees feel like women, and the worst thing in the world is to feel or look like a woman yourself. On this, the Arab Muslim detainees and the American soldiers can uh, agree. And the problem is the need to be perceived as masculine uh, comes at the expense uh, of being effective. And this gets me uh, back in a way that I didn't think I would uh, in this paper to another uh, aspect of my early work, even before I looked at the Virginia Military Institute, uh, one of the things I looked at in the study of gendering of the professions uh, was at the police, and in particular uh, at a report of the Christopher Commission, uh, whose purpose uh, about uh, 20 uh, to 25 years ago uh, was to investigate and fix not sex and gender inequality, it had no brief with respect to sex and gender, uh, but with respect to violence in the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department, in the aftermath of the Rodney King incident. Uh, in which members of the LAPD severely uh, beat a, a blast, black suspect. And even though sex and gender was not part of their mandate, if you read the report of the Christopher Commission, it comes back with recommendations that said, in effect, we've in the past constructed the role of police officer in a thoroughly masculine way. Uh, we've, we've hired people who are uh, tall and aggressive uh, and from a military background, and we've uh, promoted them on the basis of their aggressiveness. Uh, and what we uh, should have hired uh, is people who uh, are good communicators. We should have looked at social work schools uh, rather than at the military. Uh, and we should promote them on the basis of their communication skills. So this is the whole model of policing used to be gendered masculine. It might be more effective to have it gendered feminine. Now, I was really disappointed by the uh, response of the LA City Council to this report, which was, great, let's hire more women. Let's have a quota of at least 43% women in the force. Because the message isn't, of course, let's hire more women. They could be Lindy England, right? The question is, let's hire people at, for and value in them techniques gendered feminism, feminine and not confuse masculinity uh, with effectiveness. 
And unfortunately, as several people have do documented, not only uh, abroad in interrogation, but at home in policing, uh, the lessons of the Christopher Commission uh, have been uh, lost uh, in the war on terror. So uh, Susan Flutie uh, reported that Penny Harrington, the first female police chief uh, of Oregon, heard the recurring refrain as she made the rounds, uh, we don't need the women anymore uh, in the aftermath uh, of September uh, 11th. Um, and we've substituted all male counter-terrorist squads uh, for, uh, for what has been uh, community uh, policing. Um, now, I was told only to speak for uh, less than half the time. So let me uh, end with uh, a dramatic uh, contrast. Again, something I take from, uh, from my prior work. Uh, so I've talked about the gender performance requirements of the military, both for its own soldiers uh, and for its interrogators and the detainees uh, they interrogate. Uh, I've previously written about yet another set of gender performance requirements, those uh, imposed on uh, Lieutenant Colonel Martha McSally, who, while she was a US Air Force uh, fighter pilot stationed in Saudi Arabia uh, at around the turn of the millennium, brought a constitutional lawsuit against the US military because it sought to require of her, anytime she left her base in Saudi Arabia, to fully veil in an abaya, which is the uh, extremely all-encompassing form uh, of hijab, or uh, modest covering of women's bodies, that the Saudi uh, uh, custom uh, imposes, and to be accompanied at all times by a, a male whom she was uh, forced to say uh, untruthfully was, uh, was her husband. Uh, this was not a requirement of the Saudi government, and it wasn't even a requirement uh, imposed on non-military US female personnel. So State Department officials could just wear a, a light headscarf and satisfy both the US government and the Saudi government. Uh, she tried to get this changed through channels, uh, failed, uh, brought her lawsuit, and ultimately prevailed uh, in the US Congress by voice vote Unfortunately, from my perspective, largely out of sympathy with, for her as a poor Christian woman that was forced to present herself as a Muslim, and not uh, because she claimed that this violated her US constitutional right to equal protection uh, on grounds of sex, uh, because it treated her differently and, uh, and, and, and demeaned her, undermined her command authority. But I think it's instructive to look at the contrast, which in some ways is a very great contrast, in some ways isn't a contrast at all, between respecting and accommodating uh, Muslim sensibilities concerning the proper behavior of women in one case and deliberately and exploiting and violating these sensibilities uh, in the other, uh, what they have in common, I regret to say, is a systematic subordination uh, of women and of the feminine by, by the US military, as, ra as well as a, a reinforcement rather than an undercutting uh, of stereotypical assumptions about women uh, and their place. Let me leave it there and invite questions, comments, expressions of outrage or puzzlement. Yes? Do uh, interrogators appear to distinguish between um, I'm sorry, you can hear the first part of your question. Do interrogators uh, or, or other military personnel uh, appear to distinguish between um, replicating uh, hate practices that have been officially sanctioned uh, with reform of them uh, and replicating hate practices that had not? Is that, is that one of the things that influences them? Uh, I don't think it influences. I mean, I, I, again, I, I, I should say by way of caveat, Interrogation is also a subject in which I am not an expert, and I have uh, been able to do no original research. I've read all of the first person and many of the third person narratives of both the interrogators, uh, the reports, and the detainees. So th those are my sources. My sense is that in terms of which um, practices they choose to use, not so much. In terms of how they justify them, quite a bit, right? So. Uh, the, the lawyering justification, as opposed to the limits of the imagination cause, only applies to practices that, if not authorized, are at least not prohibited. So the lawyer who says, look, I'm conforming with the Geneva Convention because I'm doing to them what was done to me, uh, is less likely to say, I'm stripping them naked because I was stripped naked, and more likely to say, I'm keeping them awake or I'm keeping them in a stress position. Uh, as a justification. But in terms of where they get their inspiration from, I think the unauthorized practices are at least as strong a source of inspiration as the authorized. Yes? Um, I just wanted to understand your point about SEER. And I think what you're saying is that when we put soldiers through programs like SEER, they think that 
that's the most effective way to deal with detainees that they may encounter in the future, and it would be better to take a more gentle approach that would be more effective than what they are subjected to in SEER. Okay, so I, I am making one particular point about SEER that is not in tension with, but I think of as complementary to the point lots of other people have made about SEER. Uh, what lots of other people have said about SEER is, look, SEER isn't training in interrogation, it's training in resisting interrogation. Uh, what I and they are focusing on is the historical uh, contingency of that training, right? The training was developed during the Cold War to deal with a particular set of interrogation practices, not only in terms of how, but in terms of why interrogation was conducted. So the interrogation SEER was designed to resist was the sort of interrogation that was not designed to provide information. It was not like, you know, torture in, in, in World War II. Um, it was designed to break people down to get them to confess. So, you know, the, the, the result of the interrogation uh, that SEER was designed to prevent was uh, for example, the uh, American military officer in a North Korean prison camp saying, you know, I now understand that I am a war criminal and I have done terrible things. What that has in common with hazing is its purpose, right? In each case, the purpose is to break down the individual so as to create a new individual in the interrogator's mold, whatever the interrogator wants that mold to be. What I'm saying is, and this is my, I mean, you know, lots of people have said SEER isn't designed to train interrogators, it's designed to train resistance. What I'm saying is even the interrogation it's designed to resist against is interrogation for a totally different purpose than any legitimate, sensible purpose we have in the war on terrorism. Where we're not trying, you know, it's, it's of no, it's of little use to us if, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed breaks down and says, I now see the light and I repent of all my sins uh, and my evil deeds against the United States. What we want from him is, you know, where's Osama bin Laden, right? Uh, what's the next plot and who's going to carry it out and what's their port of entry? That's not what these techniques are designed for. That's point one. The other point that I'm not making originally, but that uh, I think I'm putting into a framework that makes a lot of sense of it, is the point that harsh techniques may break you down, but gentler techniques will get you to talk. Um, and what I'm doing is, uh, is taking that observation, which is not mine, but which I rely on from the uh, literature on the study of, uh, of interrogation, both by interrogators and by academics, and saying, What's interesting is that uh, another way of describing the gentle techniques is that they are feminine techniques. And maybe that's why there is such resistance to them. Because there is this desire on the part of the interrogators not to want to look like pussies. You know, uh, and desire to want to look tough and strong. Uh, and there's a trade-off, as there was in policing in the LAPD, between the illusion of strength and actual strength. between uh, you know, masculine gender performance and, and effectiveness. And sorry, we're following sure. the effectiveness then. Are you focusing on like a certain, um, I guess, Muslim and Arab detainees? Or are you focusing on detainees across the board? Because yeah, I guess like what I would wonder is if they don't associate those kinds of techniques with masculinity and if they maybe that we would use those because that's what they associate with someone that they would, maybe respect is not the word, but if, if in their culture that's what's effective, it seems, then why would taking a gentler approach be effective with that? Okay, number one, what you are mentioning is an argument that actually led us into the war in Iraq, according to some accounts, right? The argument is, uh, Arab Muslims uh, only understand force. You know, this is an argument that came uh, through the West, uh, through the French war in Algeria, right? Uh, and, uh, and I hear this very often from uh, you know, uh, white French uh, immigrants from 
uh, from the Maghreb uh, who say, you know, this is the only thing these people understand is force. Uh, I don't think that there is evidence of that. I mean, again, uh, both actual interrogators in the war on terror have said uh, we've gotten farther with gentler techniques, and more theoretical analyses have suggested that uh, you know affiliation uh, is you know and 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 politeness and offering tea and you know cigarettes or or conversation. Uh, is more effective even on, uh, maybe if not especially on, but even on uh, Arab male detainees. I also do not understand why it is thought that uh, sexual denigration, even assuming they were differentially uh, susceptible to uh, harm from it, even if, it, if they weren't just like the American, I mean, you know, I don't know whether, you know, white Christian you know, rednecks from Arkansas feel any differently about uh, sexual humiliation and even the particular kinds of sexual humiliation uh, than Arab detainees may, may feel. I mean, it's been argued that, that with respect to dogs, there may be a differential uh, effect given um, the attitude toward dogs in Arab Muslim culture versus the attitude to dogs here. But I think that you know, no one, whatever their background, is going to feel exactly comfortable to have a, a, a slavering dog with, with dripping jowls uh, an inch uh, in front of their face. I mean, even if you grew up with dogs and like them, that's going to not uh, go, over, go over too big. Um, so if there is, you know, and, and again, one of the things I don't understand is why it is assumed that uh, even if there were differential susceptibility to sexual humiliation, the result of that differential susceptibility would be an increase in cooperation. Uh, and uh, again, I, not being an expert, not having uh, firsthand uh, evidence, I have to uh, rely on such evidence as I can glean. Uh, and here I'm going to put in a, a piece of evidence I, I, I make the fewest claims for. It's from fiction, but it's from uh, <coughs> extremely popular fiction uh, in the Arab world. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the novel The Jacobian Building, uh, which is uh, a, a bestseller uh, written by an Egyptian about, uh, about life in Egypt. Uh, in it, there's a victim of police torture. He's picked up uh, when he's uh, just engaging in an ordinary demonstration, put in jail, um, and comes out radicalized, uh, saying, uh, I'm dead now. They killed me in detention. When, you trespass, when they trespass on your honor laughing, when they give you a woman's name and make you answer with your new name, uh, because you have to, because of the savagery, because of the torture, uh, every day they used to beat me and make me say, I am a woman, and my name is such and such. You want me to forget that and go on living? I'm not afraid of death anymore. I've made up my mind to be a martyr. Uh, you know, and, and again, this, this is a work of fiction, but by someone who is riffing off uh, the uh, alleged practices of the, of the Egyptian military. And, uh, and I am not an expert psychologist, but that seems to me to be a reasonable reaction to, uh, to that kind of treatment. If you are uh, uh, abused um, and made you know, to endure what you think is the worst thing in the world, which is to feel like a woman, uh, is your reaction going to be to, uh, you know, cooperate, or is your reaction going to be to be uh, even more intensified in your desire not to? Yes? I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about how these practices affect the women in the military. Um, like, is Lindy England uh, operating under a similar desire not to look like a pussy? Kind of what, what yes. Are the... um, so I think there's a couple of things to be asked. One is, what what is the effect on women in the military. I think there, there certainly is evidence, and there's evidence, again, of these female interrogators that start gentle and end up harsh, as do some men start gentle and end up harsh, where they will you know, specifically say they don't want to look like pussies, they don't want to look weak. Uh, whether they feel themselves differentially vulnerable for looking weak because they're women, uh, I don't know. One of the other things I wanted to look at is, is how much difference it made um, if, if a woman was perpetrating uh, these activities. And I'm not, from the perspective of the reaction, there may be a, a serious difference. From the perspective of the performance, 
I am I, I am not sure there is, but I, I don't think it does wonders for uh, societal views of women if uh, we continue to think that being called a pussy is a slur, both because it's associated with women and because it's associated with gentleness and feminine techniques. Each of those separately uh, is, uh, is, I think, uh, a problem. Yes? Um, so you've talked about denigration in terms of feminine terms as well as homosexual terms. And I was wondering if you had any evidence in your, or just anecdotes in your research uh, in terms of sort of homosexual soldiers related to what Meg asked. And then off of that, if you have any speculations or ideas on how the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell may or may not affect some of these practices. Um, OK. So first of all, uh, to, back to the Dutch military, right? Uh, we, we denigrate people by comparing them to homosexuals. The Dutch military uh, has a who cares if you tell policy. It admits openly gay people, which made this statement initially uh, quite surprising to me. When I then went and talked to Dutch gay activist friends of mine and reported this to them, uh, they accounted for it interestingly through uh, a uh, verbal tick, right? That, it is apparently the case, and again, uh, among the many things I'm disclaiming expertise on in this talk, let me add another, I disclaim any expertise in the Dutch language. Um, I am told that it, the equivalent of uh, that's so gay uh, is quite prevalent in uh, d the Dutch language, but in a way that has become deracinated. So a derogatory term to apply to someone or, for example, to their fashion choices is to call them Mietje. Mietje is a deracinated abbreviation for sodomite. Um, and these Dutch gay activist friends of mine say, this is so deracinated that you know, their nephews who accept them as openly gay will use this in conversation with them. Right? So it's, it's like sucker uh, and possibly even like pussy in some contexts. We don't necessarily uh, ha have it as an active metaphor. Um, so. Um, I think the interesting question is going to be, and many people have pointed this out as uh, an interesting question, just as um, with respect to the Virginia Military Institute, uh, a whole lot of practices, not sexual, not hazing, but ordinary practices like uh, fussing about your uniform or uh, cleaning up after your meals, which would be impermissible, or, or engaging in military drill and ceremony, which might be viewed as sissy or pussy practices if they weren't conducted in an all-male environment. In other words, their practices typically, you know, it's, it's women who care about the way they look, right? It's women who clean up after things. It's women who do cheerleading. And nothing so much resembles military drill and ceremony as cheerleading, right? Um, what, what happens to the ability to valorize these practices in, in a world in which women are now admitted is an open question. Similarly, uh, a whole lot of the more genial same-sex hazing activities, there's a, a one that gets widely reported that's, in, uh, that's a, a carnivalesque, you know, cross-dressing, sexually explicit uh, celebration that, soldier, that sailors engage in when they, for the first time, cross, I believe it is, the equator, whether that kind of um, homoerotic bonding is going to be seen as jeopardized when there might be someone uh, openly gay uh, in the room. Lots of people have speculated about. If the result is, and I don't know that it will be, because even with women in the military, we're still denigrating pussies. Um, if the result is to uh, eliminate the harsher forms of that, uh, then uh, I, I'd be pleased. I think yeah, this is one of the things that Justice Ginsburg says in her Me and My Opinion, which is that, yes, it may be true that the integration uh, of women into the service academies, into West Point, for example, in Annapolis, may have toned down the hazing. But why do we see this as a bad thing? We should see this as a good thing uh, rather than uh, something to be uh, deplored. Yes? I was wondering if you could talk about how you, or if you felt it was necessary to separate the effects of like 
widespread reports of sexual assault in the military, you know, against female soldiers, and also just societal, like, boys and girls grow up in middle schools where saying you're being such a girl or, or using woman as a derogatory term is perfectly normal in most <coughs> American middle schools, I would say. So what, like, how do you separate those effects from the actual, you know, experiences of the soldiers being the main impetus for these techniques? It seems like they might have other, you know, more important influences. Yeah, no, I, I don't mean to separate them out, and, and I'm not just talking about what happens to them in the military. I'm very explicitly also referencing what happens in the broader culture, not just in the broader culture with respect to attitudes, but in the broader culture with respect to treating, treatment. So uh, frat hazing in college, just as boot camp hazing uh, is relevant, and uh, what you're making reference to is also relevant. I do think, uh, and I do think it's interesting that uh, with respect to the victims, it's been the male victims that have gotten the most attention. One could also talk about female victims, both female Arab detainee victims and female U.S. military victims. Uh, so with respect to the female U.S. military victims, uh, Janice Karpinski, who was the uh, superintendent of Abu Ghraib, uh, reports that there were female soldiers who died of dehydration uh, because they claimed they were too afraid to go to the latrines at night for fear of sexual assault. Uh, that got less attention. It's interesting Karpinski only brought it to attention when she was being investigated, or you know, only successfully brought it to uh, the public's attention when she was being investigated. I think part of the problem uh, with respect to the focus on the male detainees as opposed to the, male, uh, the female detainees is a numerosity problem. Part of it is a problem uh, about um, it being more normal to abuse women in this way than men. And part of it has to do with the uh, deliberate decision on the part of the US authorities uh, not to publicize uh, because of concerns uh, of outrage in the Muslim world, uh, as many of the photographs and accounts uh, of the treatment of female detainees as uh, of mass. Yes. Um, so you talked a little bit about how these gentler, more feminine techniques seem to be more effective in actual interrogations once we have these people captured and they are detainees. But I was wondering if any work has been done. It seems like these harsher techniques might provide more of a deterrent for people who are considering you know, whether or not to engage in fighting. But at the same time, the outrage that these are happening to you know, fellow Muslims or fellow Arabs might also inspire them to go fight in the first place. So there seems to be sort of a, a detention or a, a tension between those two effects on people that aren't yet. Yeah, I, I have not seen, and I haven't seen anyone making empirical <laughs> claims of the first kind. That is to say, that there's any evidence at all that people are not going to be engaging in whatever activities we want to discourage. Because if they do, they might be photographed naked or forced to masturbate or what have you. Yes? Um, so um, I understood you to be saying uh, in the beginning that the other and the self with respect to, you know, Agenda attitudes and attitudes towards you know sex and so forth are not as different as you expected starting out. Uh, but uh, in sort of the broader U.S. culture, uh, at least according to me, uh, and, you know, as an outsider, I, there is an attitude of sort of a rather negative or an you know, attitude towards the Arab world with respect to how the Arab world treats women. So I was wondering how that sort of goes together with this, are they just contradictory tendencies? Or? Yeah, let me just be uh, clear as to what I was trying to say. It was less that I was trying to say that I was surprised that the attitudes were the same, as that I was surprised by what I now think of as the causal arrows, right? I took at face value the, uh, when I went into this, the account that uh, a motivating factor for the sexually derogatory techniques. Indeed, perhaps the only, or at least the principal, inspiration for these sexualized techniques uh, was 
that the US military had trained its personnel to believe that Arabs were, and Muslims more generally, were incredibly sensitive when it came to matters of sex. Uh, I, I read the Arab mind start to finish, right? There is nothing about any of these techniques in the Arab mind. There's, there's some chapters about differential uh, uh, Arab Muslim attitudes towards sex that largely go to uh, the effect on, on psychosexual development of sex segregation and the point at which sex segregation starts. You know, that boys stay in their mother's world for a while and then are exiled from the world of women and how that, that affects them. Um, there's an awful lot in the day-to-day -day experiences of these soldiers that is a lot more directly connected to the techniques they're uh, employing. So there's neither, neither these techniques nor any prediction that these techniques are going to be effective can be found in the Arab mind, which lots of people reference as the inspiration. Right? So it's not that I think that, uh, that I was surprised that the attitudes were different. Uh, I'm sorry, the attitudes were, were similar. I, I could have predicted that the attitudes were similar. What I thought the project was going to be was a project about how we treat the other. And what interested me is that we treat the other like the self. And we get our inspiration for how the other is treated and our prediction of how the other is going to react to that treatment, not from you know, orientalizing or other scholarly discussions of the other, but uh, from our own experiences. And there's also, I mean, one of the things that I want to, uh, again, harp on is there is this assumption that uh, if you treat the other like the self, that means that you're treating the other well. That's the assumption that the soldier who's, who's um, lawyering with the Geneva Conventions is relying on, right? If you treat the other like the self, that's OK, because you have to be treating yourself well. The interesting thing is the soldiers are not treating themselves well. Viz, you know, Grainer with the breaking the fluorescent fluid onto his uh, own uh, penis. Now, I don't want to suggest that there isn't any difference in attitudes toward uh, these things among Arab Muslims. And I think it's very complicated what we do in um, more ordinary contexts with that difference. Uh, I think it's beyond the scope of this particular uh, discussion and, and this particular uh, paper, but I, I have in other contexts uh, talked about it. So uh, let me talk about it a, a little bit here. I don't know uh, how many of you have, uh, are aware of my interchange with uh, my colleague Dick Posner about the opinion that he wrote uh, concerning uh, cross-sex um, guarding practices in, at American prisons. Uh, this, is a, this is an all Chicago, uh, almost, uh, discussion, right? So uh, there was a, a, a case well before the war on terror and not involving a Muslim, but involving a Christian prisoner who claimed that his rights were violated because he was put in a circumstance uh, when, where, where uh, he might be observed by female guards. So there were female guards, and they had access to the showering. You know, they, they, they could view him showering or, or using the toilet. He said this, was, this violated his right to Christian modesty. And Judge Posner was inclined to agree with him and said it would become cruel and unusual punishment. It was treating the prisoners like vermin. And it was subjecting them to experiments, such as the experiment as to whether the sexes could be made fungible. Uh, my support goes to my other colleague, Frank Easterbrook, who wrote the majority opinion, who said, look, we're not singling this guy out because of his sensibilities. We're subjecting him to a, a, a prison guarding environment that's uh, the guarding environment for everyone. Uh, that you know, Christian modesty, uh, yeah, the, 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 he, he's not being signaled out because of his, his need for Christian modesty. Um, that uh, women's em equal employment opportunities that are constitutional commitment to uh, sex equality uh, weighed in the balance uh, and uh, could lead to the result of, uh, of women being given these employment opportunities. Moreover, says Easterbrook, which is more uh, cruel and inhuman, which is more kennel-like, uh, if you didn't have women uh, with the possibility of seeing men using the toilet, you couldn't have women in the prison at all. This would be an all-male environment. This would be exactly what Ginsburg says uh, is bad for the cadets at VMI and good for the newly integrated military academies, that they get to see life in an integrated world and live in the integrated world, which is our world. 
Now, um, interesting question, how the result would look if the case had come up 10, 15 years later and the prisoner had been an Arab Muslim. Uh, because it certainly is the case that Arab Muslims, I mean, I think, I think Posner, Posner says, and this is clearly wrong, uh, the, Chris, the, you know, the, 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 the modesty taboo is strongest among Christians. Uh, there's no evidence for that, right? If it had been an Arab Muslim, then there would be a better claim that you know, there was a, a, a religious directive not to be seen naked by anyone, let alone someone of the opposite sex. And I have to say, I come down somewhat controversially in my analysis of the McSally case, that may be a, 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 an indicator of that, in saying that we don't need to uh, eliminate our commitment to sex equality, including sex equality of opportunity in prison guards, fully to um, accommodate uh, the very different preferences uh, of, for example, Arab Muslim detainees. That said, there's a world of difference between not changing our ordinary practices of subjecting people to contact with women, including women in positions of authority, which may have been as much the problem as uh, positions of, of access to nudity, um, and what did go on at Guantanamo, which is specifically targeting. You know, there, there were examples of specific targeting because of, uh, of, uh, of perceived Muslim sensibilities. I haven't talked about them that much in my discussion, partly because the evidence concerning them is uh, less clear. It's, it's, it, whenever one looks at these sorts of things, uh, there's a sort of you know, hall of mirrors or echo effect, right? You, there's one incident, and you're not sure uh, when you see reports of this incident, whether it's the same thing, incident being repeated several times or whether this is a widespread practice. But here's one thing that was going on that clearly is impermissibly targeting the peculiar sensibilities, uh, peculiar in the sense of unusual, uh, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the Arab Muslims. There were female interrogators that either off their own bat or because they were instructed to, um, you know, sexualized their interrogation, um, approached the detainees sexually, uh, rubbed faked menstrual blood, actually red ink on their hands and then on the detainees with the intent and with the knowledge that this might work of making the detainees feel ritually impure because they understood the detainees not to be permitted this sort of contact uh, with women. That seems to me unquestionably out of bounds. But I want to distinguish, and not everyone would, uh, between that, which is the, the specific targeting engaging in practices because of the person's identity and in practices that are denigrating both to the interrogator and to the victim, and ordinary contact with women of the sort that goes on in ordinary jails with women in positions of authority and positions of visibility. Some people might say that there needs to be accommodation uh, for both halves, and, and even if the accommodation involves uh, freeing Arab Muslim detainees from any contact with women if they think that contact with women is religiously impermissible. Yes? I'm a little concerned that you seem to be saying that it's the official policy of the military to endorse hazing and I think that's changed over the years. I don't think it's changed enough. I wish it had. Well, which gets me to the question. Since your research has led you to look at what people do relates to what happened to them, to, to look at the official policies with respect to hazing and with respect, on the other hand, the tolerance of what actually goes on. I relate that to if hazing doesn't isn't effective, why do people keep doing it? Well, I, I want to repeat, hazing may be effective for that which hazing is designed to do, which is what North Korean interrogation is designed to do, breaking people down so as to turn them into whoever you want them to be. Such claims as are made for its effectiveness are those claims, right? 
that that's what, that's what the process of hazing does. It promotes unit cohesion because it breaks the people down from their individual selves and builds them up into the unit we want them for. That's what VMI just, I mean, VMI is one of the few institutions that have, has actually gone into court uh, endorsing hazing. Um, I mean, what it defended all the way up to the Supreme Court was its practice of brutally and in a sex-specific way hazing its students. That's what it said would be the harm, the loss of admitting women, because that kind of hazing would no longer be possible in a cross-sex environment. So if we're looking at defenses of hazing, uh, I, I, I invite you to look at the, at the trial record in the Virginia Military Institute case, because that institution valorizes what I would call hazing. They don't call it hazing. So if hazing works, and I take no view as to whether it does, that's all it's ever claimed to work for. And again, that's what I would argue we don't want to do. And whether it's actually endorsed by the US military, I think there's two questions. What, you know, to what extent the, the, the chain of command um, authorizes or explicitly tolerates it. Um, and I don't think that it has been, um, that is as unauthorized and as condemned as you and I might I mean, you might assume and I might hope it would be. I also, though, want to come back to uh, what people like not only Rush Limbaugh but Donald Rumsfeld said. When they said it's Animal House on the night shift, what they meant is it's no big deal, right? They were not just being descriptive or sociological. They were being normative and dismissive. They were saying this happens all the time and who cares? They, you know, George W. Bush also said this is the kind of thing uh, you know, my fraternity did, right? And what I'm arguing is that that's a, a, a mistake. That's a problem. That's a view that we should change, that it's no big deal, right? It's a big deal, and it's not just a big deal when we do it to detainees. It's a big deal when we do it to ourselves. Or it ought to be a big deal for all kinds of reasons, from the effectiveness to the sex equality.